Shall we bow our heads? Our Father, what a wonderful day you have given us. What a privilege it is to be alive in these last days of the history of the world. We believe that the coming of Jesus is very close, very near. And we ask that as we study this very important subject today, that your Holy Spirit will help us understand so that we might choose to be on your side when crunch time comes. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin by mentioning something which I have underlined previously in our studies. And that is that when Jesus, or God, because Jesus is God, created this world, Adam and Eve were not eyewitnesses of the work of Jesus. In other words, Adam and Eve saw Jesus create absolutely nothing. The only way in which Adam and Eve could be certain that God was the Creator was not because they had scientific evidence, historical evidence, or empirical evidence. The only way that they could be absolutely certain was because they believed God's story when He told them, I was the Creator. They had to accept it by faith. Now God put a test in the Garden of Eden to see if they actually were willing to believe in His story. Whether they would show their loyalty to God as their Creator and as the only true God. And that test of course was a tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and let's examine several important details about this specific tree. And we're going to go very quickly because we're then going to make an application of what we study from primarily Genesis chapter 2. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Did God first give a positive command about what they could do? Yes. He said all of the trees of the garden are for your personal consumption and for your personal everyday use. But then I want you to notice that the positive command is followed by a negative command. It says in verse 17, but, remember that little word but, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God in this commandment begins with the positive. He says you can partake and enjoy of any tree of the garden, but I have reserved one tree which is off limits, which you are not to partake of. This is my tree, you are not to use it for your own personal use. Positive command, negative command. All the trees you can use except for this one. Now I want you to notice where this tree was located in the garden. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3 and let's read verses 2 and 3. Genesis 3 and verses 2 and 3. It says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the, that means middle in the Hebrew, in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Where was the tree which tested the faith of Adam and Eve in God as their creator? It was in the center of the garden. And so you have a positive command, a negative command, and you have the test in the middle. Now let me ask you, who chose the tree from which Adam and Eve were not supposed to eat? Did God tell, tell Adam and Eve, now Adam and Eve, I'm going to allow you to eat from all of the trees of the garden, but I want you to reserve one tree especially for me. Now you choose which one you don't want to eat from. Is that the way it worked? No. Who chose the tree? 
God chose the tree. Was God serious about that particular tree? Or did God really care? Would he accept Adam saying, well Lord you know I chose not to eat from that tree over there instead of the one that you specified. No, God was dead serious. God chose the tree and God is the one who said from this tree you will not eat. Now as you read the story about this tree in the book of Genesis you get absolutely no impression that this tree was any different than any other tree. We're not told that the tree was taller, that it was surrounded by a glorious light, or that the fruit of this tree was different from the fruit of any other tree. In its outward appearance we get the impression from the story that it looked just like every other tree. But what set this tree apart from all of the other trees was not its external appearance, what set it apart is the fact that God had specified that Adam and Eve were not supposed to use this tree. Now let me ask you, to whom did this tree belong? It belonged to God. How many of the trees of the garden incidentally belong to God? Do you believe that all of the trees belong to God? You know, uh, you notice for example Psalm 24 and verse 1 it says, the earth is the Lord, uh, the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words everything on planet earth belonged to the Lord. All of the trees of the garden belonged to the Lord. But let me ask you, did this particular tree belong to the Lord in a special sense over and above all of the other trees? Obviously yes. All of the trees were God's but this tree was God's in a special sense. It was not to be used by Adam and Eve. Now what was the purpose of this tree? As we read Genesis 3 we discover that the purpose was to give Adam and Eve the opportunity to recognize by not eating from the tree that the Creator was the true God and that they were creatures. How do we know that? Go with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. Here we find the devil speaking to Eve and he says this, For God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like whom? You will be like God knowing good and evil. What is the devil trying to get Eve to think? That she doesn't have to be creature, that she can be what? God. And when it says like God, you know the, the King James Version says you shall be like gods in plural. The Hebrew word is Elohim, the same word that's used in Genesis 1 verse 1 where it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The word should be translated in the singular. The devil is saying you will be like God. In other words you will be God. In other words the purpose of the tree was to test Adam and Eve to see if they recognized that they were creatures and that there was only one true God. The tree was a sign, a test that God gave them to prove that they believed that He was the true God and that they were creatures. Of course Genesis chapter 3 and verse 13 after Eve ate from the tree she complains to God and she says the serpent deceived me and I ate. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now we've talked about deception in one of our previous lectures. Let me ask you, what do you have to do in order to deceive someone? You have to lie. But what kind of lie do you have to tell in order for that lie to deceive? It has to be a lie which is very close to what? To the truth. And by the way, the counterfeit always comes after the genuine in time. I want you to remember this because we're going to come back to it. Eve complains, he deceived me. Deception is very close to the truth and deception always comes after the truth in time. And then I want you to notice what the consequence was for them eating from this tree which gave them the opportunity to show that they believed that God was the true God and the only creator. In Genesis chapter 3 
we find these words about the consequence of their action. Genesis chapter 2 actually, and let's read verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. What would be the consequence of disrespecting the tree of the Creator? Death. Now let's review what we've studied. One, God gives a positive command, you can eat of all the trees of the garden. Second, He gives a negative command of this specific tree, you shall not eat. The tree which tested Adam and Eve was in the very middle of the garden. God chose the tree from which they were not supposed to eat, and God was serious about that particular specific tree. Furthermore, that tree showed no evidence of being different from any other tree in its outward, outward appearance. The only thing that made it different is that God had set it apart from all of the other trees. Furthermore, we notice that God owned all of the trees of the garden, but He owned this tree in a special sense. The purpose of the tree was to test Adam and Eve to see if they recognized the Lord as their only God and as their Creator. And we notice that the devil deceived Eve and as a consequence the Bible tells us that because they broke God's commandment they were sentenced, sentenced to die. Now why have I gone through all of this uh, all of this material as we begin our study today. Because we're going to find that God has given another test to the world today and particularly to Christians. Now let, before we go and speak about that test let me ask you, do we have any more proof today that God was the Creator than Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden? Do we have any empirical proof that God was the Creator? Do we have any scientific proof that God was the Creator? Do we have any historical proof that God was the Creator? No. In fact in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 it says by faith we understand that the, that the worlds were formed by the Word of God. The things which are seen were formed from that which does not appear or from that which cannot be seen. So in Hebrews 11 we are told that the only reason we can know that God was the Creator today is because God says that He was the Creator in His Holy Word. We did not see it, we were not eyewitnesses to it, we must accept it by faith. Now let me ask you, has God given a test for us to show whether we believe that He is the Creator or not? Yes He has. Now go with me to Exodus chapter 20 and let's notice some very interesting things here. Exodus chapter 20 and I would like to read verses 8 and 9 first of all. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 8 and 9. It says here, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now notice that we have a positive command first. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Did you catch that? Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. What is God saying? He's giving a positive command. He's saying every week day is what? For your own personal use. But now notice that that is followed by a negative command. Notice Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10. But, do you remember that little word in Genesis 2? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. So God has given a command which is positive every day of the week is for your own personal use. But there is one particular day that is off limits to you. And so the fourth commandment has a positive command and it has a negative command. Now let me ask you this, where is the fourth commandment found in the law of God? Do you know that somebody once counted the number of syllables that are found in the Ten Commandments in the Hebrew? And that person discovered 
that the Sabbath commandment is in the exact center of the law of God it comes with the same number of syllables before and after the fourth commandment in other words the Sabbath commandment is found in the heart of the law of God just like the tree was found in the heart of the Garden of Eden now allow me to amplify this point just a little bit archaeologists several years ago were digging in, um, in a place called Ugarit in Canaan and in Ugarit they unearthed some tablets some very interesting tablets of clay now I want to tell you a few things about these tablets they were actually covenants between a great king and a lesser king I want you to remember that they were covenants that a greater king was making with a lesser king the covenant was on tablets as I mentioned the tablets were written on both sides now in the PowerPoint presentation we have pictures of several of these of these interesting tablets that were discovered they were written on both sides and interestingly enough on one side of the tablet right in the middle of the tablet was the seal of the king who was actually writing this covenant for the lesser king now it's interesting of course that this tablet was made of clay and when the clay was wet the, the king would take his seal and he would impress the seal right in the middle right square center of the tablet and of course when the seal was impressed on the tablet the writing where the seal was impressed was obliterated people could not read what was underneath the seal and that's the reason why they wrote the, uh, the, the covenant on the obverse side or on the back side you see the front side had the seal which showed that this was an authentic covenant and then the other side allowed people to read the contents of this covenant specifically now the interesting thing is that these covenants in the middle in this seal contained three items of information about the king who was actually giving this covenant or forming this covenant with the lesser king three items of information in the seal number one the name of the king who was making the covenant number two the territory over which that king ruled and number three the title or the office that that king held which in this king, uh, case would be king of such and such a location the name the title and the territory over which that king ruled or governed now somebody might say why are you bringing this up there's a very specific reason and I want you to go with me to study it go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13 Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13 this is going to get very interesting do you know that these covenants were found in the same general geographical area they were found in the Middle East uh, by the way where the Ten Commandments were given and I want you to notice the characteristics of the Ten Commandments notice Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13 it says so he declared to you his what? his covenant who is making the covenant here? God is making the covenant so he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform and what is the covenant? the what? the Ten Commandments and he wrote them on two tablets of what? he wrote them on two tablets of stone were the Ten Commandments a covenant between a great king and his followers? absolutely were they written on tablets? absolutely now there's a detail which very few people know and that is that the Ten Commandments were written on both sides of the tablets did you know that? go with me to Exodus 32 some of you did Exodus 32 and verses 15 and 16 Exodus chapter 32 and verses 15 and 16 notice what we're told here it says in verse 15 and Moses turned and went down from the mountain and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand 
the tablets were written on both their sides on the one side and on the other they were written now the tablets were the work of Moses thank you very much the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets on how many places were the tablets written? on the front side and where? and on the back side the reason why the Bible says that the Ten Commandments were given in this way is because that's the way in which covenants were given at that time which has been discovered by archaeologists who have er unearthed dozens of tablets that follow this same pattern now my question is where would you expect to find the seal of God in the Ten Commandments? you would expect to find the seal of the great God in the middle of the tablet is it in the middle of the tablet? would you expect that seal to have the name of God to have the title and his territory? absolutely go with me to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11 Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. See God uses archaeology to, to, to show things to us. Even the stones speak out if we don't. Notice Exodus 20 and verse 11. It says, for in six days the Lord, that's his name right? Yahweh or Jehovah we say. For in six days the Lord made. What is the office or what is the function of this God? of the Lord. He is the what? His title is Creator. The Lord made, what is His territory? The heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. By the way this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that has all three necessary elements of a seal. The name of the lawgiver his function or his office and the territory over which he rules. Isn't this interesting? Now allow me to say something about uh, the Sabbath and the reason why God gave the Sabbath. Did God give the Sabbath to establish the distinction between himself and his creatures? Is that what the commandment says? remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and at the end he says the reason why is because I made the world in what? in six days and rested the seventh therefore I commanded you to what? to rest on the seventh day in recognition that I was what? that I was your creator and you are the creature by the way go with me to Ezekiel 20 and verse 20 where we find this same idea Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20 here we find some very interesting words you see Israel had apostatized from God consistently time and again and in, in Ezekiel chapter 20 God is telling them about their history and he's going to explain the reason why he gave them the Sabbath notice uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20 God says, hallow Moses' Sabbaths. Oh, thank you. Hallow, or that is, keep holy my Sabbaths. And they will be a what? A sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. What was the purpose of the Sabbath? To show the distinction between the Creator and the creature to show that man believed that God was the Creator. Is this the same with the tree in the Garden of Eden? Absolutely. The tree and the day are parallel. Now let me ask you something. Do you suppose the devil loves the Sabbath? Go with me to Isaiah 14 and verse 14. I'm going to explain to you why the devil doesn't like the Sabbath. Isaiah 14 and verse 14. There's a very specific reason you see the devil was not satisfied with being a creature what did he want to be? he wanted to occupy the position of whom? of the, of the creator, of God now what do we find in chapter 14 and verse 14 here Lucifer in heaven says I 
will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the Most High. He's saying I will be what? God. It's no coincidence that he says to Adam and Eve, to Eve specifically, you will be like God. Because he had already done it where? He had already done it in heaven. He says, I will ascend and I will be like God. Let me ask you, can the devil love the Sabbath? Why can't he love the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath points to the fact that there is only one true God. And that is the God that created the heavens and the earth. The Sabbath denies Satan's right to claim to be God. Because the Sabbath is a sign that God is the creator. That God is the only true God of the universe. And if the devil promoted the Sabbath, he would definitely be promoting God. And so the devil says, I have to find a sign that points not to God, but points to whom? But points to me and my kingdom. Now let me ask you, who chose the Sabbath as the day of rest? Did God say, folks, here's seven days. I'm a generous God. I want you to dedicate one day in seven to me. You choose which. Lots of Christians would like to believe that. That God say any day in seven, as long as we take one day to rest, that's all right. Who chose the specific day that we're supposed to rest? Notice Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. It says here in Genesis 2 uh, and verses 2 and 3 the following. And on the notice the number of times seventh day is used. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day. I think he's trying to tell us that the Sabbath is the seventh day. And on the seventh day he rested from all his work which he had done and made. And then it says he sanctified the Sabbath and he rested on the Sabbath. In other words, who chose the day that he expected human beings to keep? God chose the day just like God chose the what? Just like God chose the tree. Now, how did the devil try and change the Sabbath on this earth. He needed a human instrument or a human system in order to do it. And that system we talked about last night. I'm going to read you a few statements now. I'm going to read you particularly one right now, but we'll be reading several of them. This statement is from a Roman Catholic, very reputable Roman Catholic encyclopedia called Prompta Bibliotheca. It's speaking about the authority of the Pope. And this is what it says. This is a Roman Catholic scholar writing. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or even interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as vice-regent of God upon earth with most ample power of binding and loosing his sheep. What does the Pope have the power to do? To modify, explain, or interpret divine laws. And then he says the Pope can modify divine law. Do you remember what the little horn was going to attempt to do? He thought that he could what? that he could change the law. And he did it by eliminating the second commandment. It's not in the catechisms, you can look. And by changing the de rest day from Sabbath to Sunday. You can check the website that I mentioned in our last lecture. There are 16 pages of quotations from Roman Catholic books where they openly admit that it was the Roman Catholic Church which change the day, at least in their mind, change the day from Sabbath to Sunday. Allow me to read you just one of them from a catechism. This is uh, Life in Christ, Instructions in the Catholic Faith, Faith, page 243. It says this, why did the church change the Lord's day from the Sabbath to Sunday? Answer, the church, using the power of binding and loosing, 
which Christ gave to the Pope changed the Lord's Day to Sunday. And you can look in history. Sunday was kept long before Protestants came on the scene. Sunday was kept all the way back to the third century actually. And it did not come as a result of the study of Scripture. It came as a result of several pressures within the Roman Empire, anti-Judaism, and other factors. It did not come as a result of a direct command of God. Now let me ask you this. Does the Pope, or does the papacy claim that the Pope is God's representative on earth? There are statements that even say that he is God on earth. Let me ask you, who could only be the one who could change the law of God? It would have to be whom? it would have to be God. Would the devil want to use a earthly system that claims to have God on earth to attempt to change God's law, particularly the commandment that identifies the true God? You see, how could people ever believe that the Pope is God on earth if the Pope kept the Sabbath as his sign? What does the sign of the Sabbath point to? It points to the fact that there is only one true God in heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth. You see, if the Roman Catholic papacy claims that the Pope is God on earth, the Pope could not keep the Sabbath because then people would say, now wait a minute, you say that you have the power of God on earth, but, but look, the Bible says that the Sabbath points to only one true God in heaven. And so did the papacy need to establish a different day? that would distract sight from God and would attract sight to this system. Absolutely. Now allow me to mention something which is very very interesting and some people might uh, not like what I'm going to say now but it's the truth. Do you know that the observance of Sunday as the day of rest is really idolatry? Now you say, well I've been keeping Sunday have I been an idolater? Well, perhaps not knowingly. Let me show you what I mean. Let me ask you, who created the sun? Who created the sun? God created the sun. Did he create the sun for worship? No. So what happens if you convert the sun into an object of worship? What is that called? That's called idolatry. Now let me ask you, who made the first day of the week? God. Did he make it for worship? Which day did he make for worship? The Sabbath. Did he make the first day for worship? No. So what happens if man converts it into a day of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. It doesn't make any difference whether it's an object, the sun, or whether it's a day. Anything that man makes as a substitute for worship in place of what God has established for worship is what? It is practicing idolatry. Now allow me to read you some interesting statements. See the statements get even more interesting. You know Protestants believe that they're keeping Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus because the Bible says that we're supposed to keep Sunday. But what they don't realize is that they're really continuing the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. Of course they try to find arguments from Scripture. Yeah Jesus resurrected the first day. I'm not going to argue with that. But where does the Bible say we're supposed to keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection? They say, yes, but uh, you know, Sunday's the day that's been kept for centuries. Yes, but where does the Bible say that we're supposed to keep Sunday? The fact is that Protestants in the Protestant Reformation did not go all the way in establishing the true day of worship which the Bible enjoins, and which Jesus and the Apostles kept. They simply took the tradition that came through the Roman Catholic Church and continued this as the day of worship. Now, do you want to hear what Catholics say about this? This is what one Catholic scholar says. Actually there's two, Reverend Leo J. Tress and John J. Castellot. Nothing is said in the Bible about the change of the Lord's Day from Saturday to Sunday. We know the change only from the tradition of the church. A fact handed down to us from the earliest times by the living voice of the church. That is why we find so illogical the attitude of many non-Catholics who say that they will believe nothing unless they can find it in the Bible and yet will continue to keep Sunday as the Lord's Day on the say-so 
of the Catholic Church. Here's another one. This one is even more meaningful. This one is uh, by H. Canon Caferata. A word about Sunday. God said, remember that thou keep the Sabbath day holy. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. Why then do we keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday? He says, the church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants who say that they go by the Bible and the Bible only, and that they do not believe anything that is not in the Bible, must be rather puzzled by keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So without knowing it they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. Here's another one. I'll read one more. This one is from uh, uh, Father Enright who for many years was a uh, teacher at the uh, Redemptorist College of America. He was actually president of the Redemptorist uh, College of America. He says this, it was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day. See notice, changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday. By the way, does the prophecy of the little horn say that the little horn would think that he could change the law of God? Yes. And so he says, it was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday, the first day of the week. And it not only compelled all to keep Sunday, but urged all persons to labor on the seventh day under pain of anathema. That's being accursed. Protestants profess great reverence for the Bible. And yet by their solemn act of keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the power of the Catholic Church. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the Catholic Church says, no. Keep the first day of the week, and now notice this, and lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Is this an important issue? This is a very important issue. You say, why is it important? Let me ask you. Does the Sabbath look just like any other day? Does the Sabbath have 24 hours? Does the sun rise and set on the Sabbath? Do you get up and go to bed on Sabbath? Is Sabbath one of the numbers on the calendar? You look at the Sabbath, the Sabbath looks just like any other day. What makes the Sabbath different? Not its outward appearance, like the outward appearance of the tree was not different. What makes the Sabbath different is the fact that God what? God set it apart. Now I want you to imagine that in your pocket you have two dollars. One dollar is for you to go to the market and you can't buy much with one dollar I realize. One dollar to buy things at the market and the other dollar you've set aside for tithe. Let me ask you, do those uh, two dollars look exactly alike? Yes? Are they printed on paper? Are, are they worth the same amount? So they're exactly the same, right? There's no difference between the, the two dollar bills. Are they different? Sure they are. What makes them different? The fact that one is set apart for a holy use and the other one is for secular use. The Sabbath was set apart by God. Not because it is different than other, any other day but because God simply wanted to set it apart to test the faithfulness of man in recognizing him as their creator and as their God. Now you say, Pastor, it doesn't really make any difference which day we keep. If God didn't change the day and the papacy did, whose authority are you accepting? You know, obedience is the highest form of worship. If you say you worship God and you disobey God knowing that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath and you don't, whose authority are you accepting? You're accepting the authority of the individual who changed the day. So the final conflict has nothing to do with just one day versus another day. The issue is whose authority do you accept? Do you accept the authority of the true God, the Creator, who made the Sabbath and you keep the Sabbath as a sign that you are loyal to Him? Or do you keep the first day of the week thus accepting the authority of the power that changed the day from Saturday to Sunday? The issue is whose authority do you accept? Not which day specifically you keep. 
By the way, we have a story in the Bible that shows how serious in the mind of God it is when we do not respect what He has made holy. When we offer God something secular as if it was holy. We have in Leviticus chapter 10 the story of Nadab and Abihu. I'll tell you very quickly the story. In Leviticus 9 it says that God rained fire from heaven down on the altar. That was holy fire. And God said to Israel, I want you when you take fire, when the priests take fire into the sanctuary, make sure that they use holy fire from this altar. Not any kind of fire, this fire, because this fire is holy. But the Bible says that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, they were under the influence of wine. By the way, Babylon at the end of time is under the influence of spiritual wine. False doctrine. That does not allow them to think straight. And so under the influence of wine, they actually took common fire and they took it into the sanctuary. Now let me ask you, if you had looked at the two fires, would they look alike? Sure. If you analyze the chemical properties of both, would the chemical properties be alike? If you put your finger in both fires, would the fire burn your finger? Of course. So the fires were just alike. So what distinguished one fire from the other? It was not its external ex appearance. What distinguished the two fires was that God had said, this fire is holy and this fire is common. And you will present to me holy fire. Of course God isn't as particular today. God today doesn't really mind. He doesn't care. He says, just bring me anything. Did God change? The cross changed God. He was particular before and now he's really lenient. Come on folks, does God change his character? Does God still expect us to offer him as holy that which is holy? Absolutely! And the Bible says that Nadab and Abihu bought, brought in strange fire, the Bible says. That means common everyday fire. And God said, oh well thank you very much, fire's fire. I don't mind. No, the Bible says that the glory of God came out and consumed Nadab and Abihu there because they took common fire and they offered it to God as if it was holy. How do you suppose God feels when we take a common working day and present it to God as if it were holy? Now most Christians don't realize this. The ministers, I might say, to a great degree are to blame because God has given them a Bible to study and a Bible to preach to share with their congregations the truth even if it's unpopular even if everybody leaves the church ministers should be faithful to God and preach the truth though the heavens fall do you agree with that? Amen. I'll tell you folks the blood of many people are going to be on me if I don't tell you the truth I might say some things that appear to be hard and harsh but they're the truth and God wants us to, to know them and to obey them because the destiny of souls depends upon it and by the way we find in Exodus 31 verse 15 that God says that whoever tramples upon the Sabbath is to be put to death you say well we don't put people to death anymore today that's true because Israel lived in a theocracy but reckoning day will come if we trample upon God's Sabbath knowingly and say I know that the Sabbath is a day I'm supposed to keep but I'm going to go ahead and keep on keeping Sunday because that's what my church says, that what's, that's what my minister says, that's what my friends do, that's what my relatives do if we insist on doing that we might not be destroyed now but when Jesus comes it will happen. By the way folks do you know what the final controversy and the final conflict is all about? It's not about the oil of the Middle East. It is not the Arabs against the Jews. It is not a war of East against West. It is a war that has to do with two things. Number one, worship. And number two, obedience. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. By the way, do you know that worship has to do with the first table of the law, right? First table of the law is the one that has to do with our relationship with God. That deals with the issue of worship. So which table is involved especially in the final controversy? It's the first table of the law. Now notice Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, and let's read verse 15. It says here, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not what? 
worship the image of the beast to be killed. What is going to be imposed? False what? False worship according to this. Now the question is, does the devil hate the commandments of God? Is the final conflict going to have to do with the commandments of God? Absolutely. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. We've read this verse before. Time and again in Revelation we find this idea. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. It says here, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, that is with the church, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, or as the King James says, with the remnant of her seed. Who what? Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. This is the conclusion of the third angel's message, God's final message to the world. It says there in Revelation 14 verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who what? Who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And by the way, if you read the previous verses, verses 9 through 11, you're going to find that there's a contrasting group. That group worships the beast and his image and receives the mark of the beast. So there's a contrast between those who worship the beast and receive the mark of the beast and those individuals who keep what? Who keep the commandments of God. Now the question is, what is the mark of the beast? Well, perhaps we should let the Catholic Church itself explain. By the way, what is the beast? Did we study the beast? Who is the beast? It is the Roman Catholic Papacy. Was that clear in your mind? Very clearly, scripturally, it's the Roman Catholic Papacy. So must the Roman Catholic Papacy have a mark or a sign of its power? Obviously. Now I'm going to read you a couple of statements here. This is from the Catholic record, a Roman Catholic journal, the date is September 1, 1923. It's an old publication. Here's what it says. Sunday is our mark of authority. Did you catch that? Why would it be a mark of authority? Listen, if the papacy claims to be the power that changed the law of God, then the papacy must have God on earth. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And by the way, every single prophecy that refers to the papacy, there's something concerning the law. I'll give you some examples. In Daniel chapter 7 it says that he thinks he can change the law. In 2 Thessalonians 2 it says he's called the man of lawlessness. The man of sin. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Uh, in, in, uh, with respect to other places that speak about the Antichrist. You have this same idea coming through that there's something happening with the commandments. In Revelation chapter 13 you have him imposing what? The mark of the beast. See it all has to do with the law of God. So it says Sunday is our mark of authority. And then comes this comment. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. That is powerful stuff. There was an individual who in 1895 wrote to um, uh, James Cardinal Gibbons. I don't know if you've heard of James Cardinal Gibbons. Very famous cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. This individual wrote to him asking him if the Roman Catholic Church considered the, the Sunday the change of the Sabbath to Sunday as a mark of her authority and power. And uh, I'm going to read that statement. This is the answer from Chancellor H. F. Thomas given to this question. Does the Roman Catholic Church claim the act of changing the observance of the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day of the week as a mark of her power? Here's the answer. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. It could not have been otherwise, as none in those days would have dreamed of doing anything in matters spiritual and ecclesiastical and religious without her. And now comes this, and the act, that is the act of changing the day, the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. 
The beast itself identifies what is the sign or the mark of its power. It's the change in the holy law of God. The change of the Sabbath to Sunday. And let me ask you, what happens when individuals observe the Sunday as the rest day knowing who changed the rest day? Whose authority are they accepting? They are not accepting the authority of God, they are accepting the authority of whom? The authority of the power that changed the day. Once again the issue is not, is Sabbath better than Sunday? The issue is, who are you confessing as your authority by keeping the Sabbath? And who are you confessing as your authority by keeping the Sunday? The issue is, who do you obey and who do you worship? Do you worship the Creator who, and the day that He gave at the beginning on that day or do you worship on the day that has been changed? By the way, do you remember that uh, in the Garden of Eden the devil deceived Eve? Is it possible that the devil is deceiving the majority of the Christian world? You say, ah, oh, pastor, that can't be possible. You don't think so? You look at the whole history of the church from the Old Testament and New Testament, you'll find that the vast majority were always wrong. How many in the days of Christ were right? A handful, and you know it. The rest were an apostasy. In fact, it was a union of church and state that crucified Jesus. The church using the power of Rome to crucify Jesus Christ. Do you think it's going to be any different at the end of time? You think that the majority of those who claim to be followers of Jesus are really going to be followers of Jesus? That would totally go against the grain of everything that has ever happened in human history, incidentally. Now allow me to end by mentioning several details here. I'm going to have to do it quickly. We won't be able to read the verses. Do you know in the Bible what it is that God constantly writes upon our foreheads? By the way, Revelation speaks, makes a contrast between the mark of the beast, which is given on the right hand and on the forehead, and the seal of God, which is given where? On the forehead. The seal of God and the mark of the beast are opposites. Is that clear? Revelation 14.1 speaks of a group that have the seal of God on their foreheads. The immediately preceding verse speaks about those who have the seal of the beast on their foreheads. So the mark of the beast is opposite to the seal of God. Now let me ask you, the seal of God is placed where? In the forehead. What is it that you have behind your forehead? Your mind. What does God write on our minds? Go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. I want you to see, to see that the seal of God has to do with His law. With His commandment. Writ commandments written on our hearts and on our minds. By the way, the only other place that something is written on the hand or on the forehead is in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where God says, I will write my laws and my statutes and my words upon you. You should write them on your right hand and on your forehead. Which means that, that your actions should reflect the law of God and your thoughts should reflect the content of the law of God. Notice Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be what? and they shall be my people. One final point before we draw this to a close. I've mentioned that in Revelation 14 God gives a message to the world to counteract the errors of Babylon this message is known as the three angels messages. I want you to notice what the first angels message says in calling the world to renounce the errors of Babylon. Chapter 14 of Revelation and verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. By the way, this is in the very end time. God is warning the world because He's going to say that Babylon has fallen because Babylon did not accept this message. And so it says, 
saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And now notice, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Where does that quotation come from? Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters? It comes from the fourth commandment of the holy law of God. The first angel brings attention to the fourth commandment to the Creator, to worship the Creator. And by the way, we've read from Isaiah chapter 66 in verses 22 and 23 where when we get to the kingdom, when God makes a new heavens and a new earth, the Bible says that all flesh will go from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship before the Lord. You see the Sabbath was God's plan at the beginning. The Sabbath will be God's plan in the earth made new. And the Sabbath has been God's plan in between. It is man who has changed the day. The papacy has adopted this Sunday as its mark of authority. But we must choose the mark of authority of God. The sign between God and His people.